What is emergent behavior? Well, this is the concept of a very complex behavior arising from the interaction of very simple units. Um, one way to think about this, and one way it's often used, is with insects. Ant colonies are incredibly complex machines, effectively, but each ant is very simple and only deals with a tiny little bit of that entire operation. But when these come together, you end up with a very complex behavior. Now, emergent behavior is often used to describe the interaction of individuals, insects, fish, birds, whatnot, but it can also be used in electrical systems to design behaviors in that might appear more complex than would be capable with the parts involved. This concept was used in the very first autonomous robots, Elmer and Elise. They were two tortoises, so-called, built by William Gray Walter ages ago, in the late 1950s and early 60s. And these were very simple little robots with only a couple effective neurons designed with vacuum tubes. Because these systems would interact in such a way that it would allow a more complex behavior than necessarily any of the individual parts would allow, you could build very interesting robots. These concepts may have been known since the earliest days of robotics, but they were sort of abandoned in the favor of the more complex microcontroller-based robotics due to their flexibility. However, they had a bit of a breath of fresh air in the 80s and 90s with uh, beam robotics, obviously, um, Tilden, and then also Rodney Brooks explored some of these systems as well. And these were robots that would use simple rules to control some parts of the robot, and those systems would interact in a way that would sometimes produce very complex behaviors out of it. Again, this was the emergent behavior. Now these systems work in a couple different ways, but usually they would have a series of neurons, electronic neurons. And these were either um, self-oscillating or kind of a time delay neuron. So they would take an input signal, stay high for a certain amount of time and drop down, or they would just flip the input signals with a delay um, continuously. And then you could interact a bunch of levels of these and produce very complex behavior in neural nets, which is not to be confused with the modern usage of neural nets, but they are actually related. And we'll come back to that in a second. So how do these actually control a robot? How do you build them? And uh, what does a robot that runs off of a system of neurons look like? Well, let's, uh, let's build one and see. So let's look at the circuit for this robot. It looks pretty complicated, but we'll break it into smaller parts and it makes a lot of sense. First, let's look at this uh, top part of the circuit here. So if you're familiar with beam robotics, you'll know this is a set of suspended bicores. So what that means is you've got two inverter logic gates here, coupled together by a couple capacitors. So the output of this gate will come out, go through this capacitor, and then into the input here. The output will come here, it'll flow through here, and it'll change this output to opposite of this input. So you'll end up with a state where both these are opposite each other, this output will be high, that output will be low, and then those will kind of feed into each other. Now, if we put a resistor across these two points, so across both inputs, well, then this charge from this capacitor is gonna bleed into that, and they will always wanna equalize because they're always going to be opposite. So it'll set up into a state, that charge will bleed across. When it gets to the switching point over inverters, they'll flip, and both will basically flip at the same time, and then you get into that state. It'll just keep going back and forth, flipping. And how quickly it flips depends on the size of these capacitors and the size of this resistor. By adding a couple photodiodes in across this resistor, we can make it light sensitive. So this is a light dependent bicore that's both its period and its uh, phase will change depending on how much light it has. Now, if we look down here, this is just a plain old bicore. It just has a resistor across but it's coupled into this top one through these two quite large resistors. And these resistors are bigger than the regular suspending resistors. So it means that this will influence this lower bicore, but it won't become coupled ever. The, the difference is too great between these resistors here and then the period of this top one, which will change quite a bit. So you'll have the top one changing phase with this and it'll be influencing it constantly. As these go in and out of phase, the behavior output of this one will change depending on a whole bunch of factors there. So you have two quite simple setups here, and they're both influencing each other, and then you get a more complex behavior out of that, which is 
where emergent behavior comes from. Now, you could couple motors directly to here and ground, but we actually have something else going on here. So this is the motor drive section. So we actually couple this lower bike or the motor drive bike or into a couple inverters through another set of capacitors. And what that means is that the output of here has to be changing to drive these. Um, when it goes high, that'll give an input output to here, but it's actually coupled to ground as well. So the normal output of these uh, inverters will be high because they're an inverter and it's coupled to ground. But as this switches, it'll give a pulse which turns that low and then allows the motor to drive because we have another set of um, inverters down here, which is also coupled to ground. So that inputs to ground, this inputs coupled to ground. It only spins these motors when the bicore up here switches and charges up these capacitors, which then can um, allow this to go low and drive our motors. And there's one extra little thing here, which is a little system which allows our robot to avoid obstacles. So if we have a positive connection to the inverter gate here, coupled with a slightly larger capacitor, that'll mean when this gets touched, this will go high, which will pull this low. And because this other side is pulled low, that comes high, this motor will want to run in reverse normally. And then by having a relatively large capacitor, that'll allow us to pull this uh, gate high for a little bit of time. So that once that switch is closed, the robot, this motor will start to back up and this will keep this inverter switched on for a while to allow our robot to turn out of the way and get out of trouble. And then we have one for both the right and left side. All right, so that's enough talking. Let's actually get to building this robot. First, let's breadboard this and make sure that we have everything working. There is a whole mess of capacitors and resistors on here, but the circuit worked pretty well. Here I just have LEDs instead of motors here, and it's a little bit easier to see how the circuit is reacting to light and the other inputs. And then you can see here I also have the reverse switch set up here. I had to vary the size of the capacitors a little bit. This was a little bit too big. Um, I think I went with 1.5 microfarad, but obviously it's going to depend on your circuit. The base was this little thing I'd built. It was actually for a little micro sumo robot that I didn't end up doing anything with. Um, so I thought it would make a pretty good platform for this. And then I freeformed the main brains of the whole circuit from that. The circuit itself is all built off of this single chip. My motors were small enough that I was able to drive them directly off of the inverter gates on the chip. If you're using a more, uh, more current hungry motors, you might not be able to do this but I got lucky and I didn't need to uh, use any sort of motor driver as well. This freeformed pretty well on the chip, the capacitors and everything tucked in nicely along the sides. The resistors and the extra timing caps for the reverse were a little bit big, but I managed to kind of fit everything in on the end. I then also went, uh, when I had everything finished up, I put the photodiodes pretty much directly onto the main chip. This allowed me to be a bit more compact, although ideally the spacing of the diodes would be a little bit wider than what I ended up with. Um, I made up these little touch sensors for the reverse feelers or the reverse switches and they're just a small length of brass tube and then I have a very flexible very thin piece of piano wire on the inside which is held in the center of the tube by a bit of um, uh, insulation from a piece of wire I had stripped off which actually worked pretty well and then I actually glued it in place after that. And here is the completed robot. It did require a bit of tuning, especially the reverse timing capacitors, and I did need to shade the eyes a little bit to decrease the sensitivity and directionality of the light, but it worked very well. This is able to navigate perfectly fine around the apartment, and it seems to exhibit some very complex behaviors, including a weird ability to get itself unstuck from places. Um, I think this is because the variance between the drive motor or the drive bicore and the light bicore means that the 
it's always going in and out of phase with each other. And then it also, when it's exposed to quite a bright light, it's quite directional. But when it's exposed to a dimmer light or in less bright environments, it seems to move around a lot more, like go side to side, which is able to kind of, I guess, get itself out of situations which it might otherwise be stuck in. This was especially interesting when I put it on my desk with the desk lamp and it was able to kind of do these weird circles and kind of interesting behaviors. Occasionally it would just go straight away from the light without any reaction. Now this robot is much more complex and also has much more complex behaviors than something like Herbie, which I've built in the past. This one seems to be directionally affected by the light, but it's not a completely phototactic thing. It seems to move a little bit based on, I don't know, external factors or internal factors, depending on what state different parts of the circuit are in. So it is affected by light, but it's not exactly gonna follow light all of the time. And that makes it much more interesting to play with than something that is uh, purely based on kind of the direction of light and it will just go straight toward that. All right, thanks a lot for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. I will touch on one quick extra thing here. I did mention neural nets earlier on in the video and how these beam systems share some similarities with the more advanced neural nets we use in modern AI. And you might wonder, could you build a neural net or a you know, large language model or something like that on a bunch of beam neurons? In theory, probably, but in reality, it would probably never work because these systems are similar in how they function, but beam robotics, especially when you get into very large you know, nets of these neurons, they become somewhat unstable. It would also be impossible to train as these are not something that is, you need to physically rewire the entire system to get a different behavior out of it, which would be incredibly impractical on the scales you would need to build these systems. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you next time. Take care.